Welcome to this Global Donor Platform virtual briefing with Duncan Pruitt and Chris Jochnik of Oxfam, who will be talking to us today about their experience with trying to convince large corporations to take the issue of land more seriously for their operations. Before we actually start with the briefing, I wanted to ask the two, what is the key finding, maybe counterintuitive finding, that you've had in your work? Uh, thanks, Pascal. Um, hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I, so I was thinking about um, what, you know, what's uh, special about um, our experiences recently, and I would say that probably one of the key things is, is the fact that we've had the pace with which we've seen change uh, in, uh, across uh, the food and beverage sector in the last uh, year or so, where they, they've made um, commitments in relation to particularly free, prior, and informed consent. Uh, within the space of pretty much a year, a large part of that sector, um, when it's taken um, over 10 years for the same kind of achievements to, um, or the same kind of movement to be seen in the extractive sector. So that's something which we've been really happy about. Um, but, uh, Chris, what do you think? What's the, what, what, what's the most unusual thing from your side? The speed of this was remarkable. Um, when we started, we were and we came out with a set of asks, and we were told by a number of people on the inside of companies that we might get a few of the things, but we would never get a company, for example, to talk about land grabs. Uh, certainly not zero tolerance for land grabs. And uh, when we approached Coca-Cola first, Coca-Cola said that they had done, did audits all over the world that land was not an issue for them, and they basically were humoring us in those discussions and. Um, and for, for telling a little of our story today, but in six weeks, they came out with a zero tolerance for land grabs commitment, which was uh, remarkable. Uh, I, you know, certainly surprised me how, how quickly and how thoroughly uh, they jumped on board. So that was uh, a bit counterintuitive, I would say, the pace, as, as Duncan mentioned. This presentation is, is uh, really me introducing Chris and then uh, me uh, drawing some conclusions afterwards. In terms of the, the wider Oxfam land program, it's just, this is just a point to make, make, you, make sure that we more than just focus on the private sector, as, as, as some of you know anyway. Um, of course, we've got a very strong focus on public policy as well. So we've been very engaged in the, the discussions around the voluntary guidelines um, and also the discussions about agricultural investment, including the, the upcoming RAI negotiations in, in Rome. Um, we've also focused on development finance beyond simply the private sector, um, uh, looking at the role of the World Bank and its practices and ways to uh, move those forward. And we, we've also done quite a lot of work in country. Um, my, I would estimate, because it's difficult to get the exact figure, but around 30 countries uh, you'll find uh, some kind of Oxfam programming on land, usually building the capacity of civil society to engage um, as in land reform processes or as, as watchdogs um, or, or community level in, engagement. Uh, our, our work on private sector, I'll come back to in a moment, but it's broader than just the food and beverage sector and behind the brand. Um, and I think the final thing is that, is that now we're, we're trying to build up our work on targets and, and monitoring and, and uh, we're working with um, uh, GLTN and, and, and others uh, to look at how we can really support um, this discussion uh, both within the CFS in relation to the voluntary guidelines, but also um, in relation to the post-2015 process. That, that's, let's say, something about our broader uh, land program. Um, this timeline just gives a bit of a sense of how we've done this kind of evidence-based advocacy towards the private sector um, uh, and connected our, our experiences on the ground to um, international advocacy opportunities um, over recent years. And it, it, to a certain extent, we, you know, we've, we've built on our experiences with the extractive sector um, and uh, on palm oil, uh, which, which are more than 10 years of work. And, but in 2011, when, when the land uh, discussion was really uh, peaking a bit, uh, we, we uh, released a paper which, which laid out an overall agenda for change on land issues, accompanied by five cases which showed how um, companies have um, become embroiled in, in uh, land grabs of one kind or another. But uh, in addition to looking at specific cases um, and doing advocacy around those cases, we, we've also um, uh, looked at ways in which the financial sector can improve its practices, um, including the IFC, of course. Um, and uh, you know, development finance, we, we believe, has got a key role in influencing other kinds of development because it's often 
uh, uh, the first kind of uh, investment that uh, companies try to get in order to leverage other forms of investment. Um, and then, uh, you know, in the last uh, year or two, we've, we've focused on food and beverage companies, and uh, and of course we're, we're going into the um, rye debate. So that, there's a longer list there. You, you can peruse it at your at your leisure. We've done quite a few things particularly in the last four years. There's some, I, we, we can come back to it more later, but uh, in terms of evidence of uh, uh, the impact of some of the work that we've been doing, um, I've, the, this uh, next slide gives, a, gives some, um, some ideas of, of where that's coming. So s certainly we've seen um, some uh, quite credible steps to remedy the cases that we've highlighted internationally, all of which in some ways have a different profile and, and test out different accountability mechanisms or raise different issues. Um, and uh, we, in some cases, we've even had the satisfaction of, of um, being uh, part of a process which, which uh, sees land being returned to people who were kicked off it in the first place, um, in, for instance, in Uganda and Guatemala. But then we've also seen um, commitments at, um, in, in the private sector directly. For example, a large part of the Dutch financial sector made commitments in 2012 and the IFC um, uh, just this year um, reflected on a sorry um, showed evidence that they were implementing reforms in, in a number of areas which we'd been um, pushing quite strongly. For instance, with financial intermediaries, um, and then of course there's the results on behind the brands. So we see this as all all um, pieces of evidence that change is coming. But of course, you know, change needs to be needs to be much uh, wider than this. But at this stage, I'm going to uh, hand over to Chris to talk a bit about our experience with uh, Behind the Brands. Chris, I hand over to you. Great. So I'm going to just run you through this Behind the Brands campaign. I hope that most of you will have at least a passing familiarity with it. Uh, we launched this a little more than a year ago. The um, impetus for it was the recognition at Oxfam that, that um, the food system was really not working for smallholder farmers, not working for consumers, um, that companies played a huge role in, in determining uh, who got what, under what conditions, and uh, how people benefited. Uh, we wanted to put pressure on those companies, um, and we wanted to find a way to engage the public around it. So when we looked out across the food uh, chain, uh, from the 1.5 billion producers to the 7 billion consumers, we saw some critical points of potential leverage. And really, um, while there are about uh, 100,000 multinationals in the world, there's only about 500 of them that really dictate most of the food choices. Uh, and that number becomes much smaller when you get into certain points of the, the supply chain. So the traders and processors like Cargill and Bungie have enormous uh, influence over certain commodities. And they can control, in this case, if you look at global grain, uh, just three of them uh, control 90% of the grain trade. Uh, then one step up, you have the food companies who are themselves very powerful and have enormous brand recognition like Nestle and others. And then, of course, you have the retailers like Walmart. We had to decide where we wanted to focus our attention. Uh, we decided that the traders and processors really have a lot of the control but are not well known enough to the public. And so we went one step up and looked at the food companies. And when you look at the food companies, uh, looking just across the top 10 companies, you see an enormous breadth of actual um, food brands that are very recognized to the consumer. So any one of these companies may have uh, hundreds of well-known brands uh, that sit underneath them. In some cases, um, people may not even realize uh, that they're drinking or eating a, a Pepsi product uh, because the, the brand is so uh, obscured. But we do know that these food and beverage companies uh, in particular are, are sensitive to consumer pressure uh, and if you look at this uh, recent survey, you get a sense of just how important the brand of these companies can be. We know that, for example, the brand of Coca-Cola, its most important asset is worth about $80 billion. Uh, that's true of many of these companies. Uh, so that if, if we could put a little bit of pressure on their reputation, on their brand, we figured we could get some uh, movement from these companies. So we designed this uh, Behind the Brands campaign. Uh, and if you go to the website of Behind the Brands, you'll get this will be your first uh, slide. And then you, it asks you to click on a favorite brand. And uh, going into the brands, you will then come to this scorecard where we ranked the 10 companies on seven critical issues, 
along their supply chain. Those issues being land, women, farmers, workers, climate emissions, transparency, and water. And we put it on a very simple scale, one to 10. Uh, we designed that very purposefully to make it accessible to the public at large and to consumers. Uh, again, this was very much an effort to raise awareness and create some kind of a, a public, we call it a public dialogue between consumers and the large brands. It took us about 18 months to put this campaign together. Uh, the indicators are quite extensive underlying those scores of one to 10. Each one of those scores has, a, has about 40 or 50 uh, specific indicators, 270 in total. Uh, it's very transparent. Everything, all the information is online. So there can never be any question about where we got our information from or what the, what the indicator uh, says or asks for. The indicators were designed with the companies themselves and with outside experts and with NGOs. So we heard from all sides. Uh, we wanted to make sure it, was, it both pushed the envelope, but it was um, realistic. Uh, there's a real push for transparency and uh, due diligence, meaning we want companies to really understand the impacts of their supply chain, and we want them to show that to the uh, public at large. Uh, and the indicators focus on these four broad categories. Awareness, meaning is the company at all aware of this issue? So in the case of land, for example, many companies never discussed land a year ago when we launched it, and they would get a score of one because you couldn't find the issue of land in any of their sustainability reports or their CEO statements. The next one is knowledge. Are the, is the company doing anything to actually understand the problem? Is it doing impact studies, for example? Uh, the next one is commitment. Is the company making any serious commitments to address the issue? And then finally, is it pushing those commitments down through its supply chain via a supplier code of conduct? Here's a, a, a quick glance at the land indicators. This is not meant to so that you can read them all. You can go online and very quickly come to this page and look at it, but it just gives you an, an idea of the level of detail uh, that we would go into. And if you look over on the right, uh, we give a score and then we source the reports. It has to be publicly available for us to include it in, as part of the scoring so that the public can very quickly see why we gave a certain score and um, where that report sits. We asked the companies to provide all of this information for us, uh, which they did because that, it's such an extensive amount of information that we needed to weed, weed through. And so all of the 10 companies engaged with us in this process of developing the, the scorecard and actually doing the scoring. And that was one of the nice um, things of, about this is that they could have ignored it, uh, but they decided that it made sense for them to engage with this process. And um, they really have been very uh, constructive and, and cooperative in providing information and, and discussing these things with us. So um, when we launched, um, we did, made a big push to consumers and to the public, but we also went to the investors and we got initially 33 investors now it's up to um, above, well above that, and uh, these investors represent over a, a trillion and a half dollars in assets under management. They all signed a letter and put, to put pressure on the companies around the Behind the Brands campaign, which helped us, so that we were really designing this campaign to bring pressure from various sides, from the public side, from the investor side, from the media side, from our own engagement um, A year later, we did an update of the scorecard. Uh, apologies that this is not a very clear screen, but you get a sense of how the score shifted. So the little box was the prior score. The big box is how the companies looked one year out. All of the companies improved their scores. Some even got into the green of eight out of 10, which is quite good. Um, if you go online, you'll see a clearer version of that. The way we designed this campaign is that we, um, after design, after putting out the initial scorecard, we then focused on certain issues. So our first issue, we focused on the gender. Uh, and we looked at three big companies uh, with an impact on gender and cocoa, and we pushed those companies to make commitments. We then looked at land, and we looked at the three largest um, companies, uh, purchasers of or producers of sugar amongst our top ten. So that was Coke, Pepsi, and ABF. And we went to the streets. We went to their CEOs. We went to the investors to put pressure on those companies. Here's this, uh, one of our uh, our public demonstrations. Um, and we, this was a, a slide that gives you a sense of why we went after the, those three companies in particular around land grabs uh, because of the size of their market share or their size in terms of ABF in, in actually producing sugar. And this is what we asked the companies. We, we basically asked them for three things. We want them to first know and show. Anybody familiar with the Ruggie process will understand uh, know and show. That means basically 
do the impact studies and disclose information uh, about um, the particular impact. So we asked the companies to disclose their, their largest suppliers, this is in the case of land, on sugar, palm oil, and soy, and to start doing land impact studies and to, to make those studies public. All of this information was not available publicly when we launched the campaign. Secondly, we wanted them to commit. Uh, we wanted them to commit to zero tolerance for land grabbing. Uh, and in particular, we wanted them to commit to free prior informed consent and put it into a supplier codes. And third, we wanted them to become public advocates. Uh, and this was really important that, that we wanted these companies to exert influence on others uh, around uh, their, their commitments to free prior informed consent and land rights. And so uh, those are the three commitments we went out with. Again, we were told we would never get companies to uh, commit to zero tolerance for land grabbing. We wouldn't get them to become public champions. We might get them to disclose their suppliers, or at least some of them. Coca-Cola came around almost immediately. In six weeks, they gave us everything we wanted and actually went beyond what we were asking for. This is only a small um, piece of, of their zero tolerance for land grabbing commitment. You can see it all online. They've put it up very prominently on their website. Um, but they've said that they're going to commit to their free prior informed consent. Uh, they don't um, distinguish between indigenous communities and other affected communities. So it, it goes wider than uh, other definitions of free prior informed consent. And they put it into their supplier codes. Uh, so it is, it is now um, a responsibility of all their suppliers to also abide by that commitment. Uh, they've committed to exerting political pressure or their own pressure, public pressure, uh, around free prior informed consent at various fora. And this has been very useful uh, in terms of um, putting a spotlight on these issues and creating some additional um, uh, pressure on, on other companies that are taking part in these, uh, in these different uh, standard setting exercises. Um, and they also committed to addressing some of the specific conflicts that we had uncovered in our, ourselves and others had uncovered in Cambodia and Brazil and elsewhere. They also agreed to do 16, uh, to look at the 16 largest uh, sugar sourcing countries and to do public, in, public human rights impact studies around land and, um, and to have those studies then brought into um, public discussions where stakeholders could engage with Coca-Cola and suppliers around uh, land conflicts. This last slide just gives you a sense of where we are now. Uh, after Coca-Cola, it took us another month and a half to pressure Pepsi sufficiently that they also agreed to all of the asks. So they also made a zero tolerance for land grabbing commitment. They've done all the same things as Coca-Cola, essentially. And subsequently, we've seen actually eight of the 10 companies now commit to three prior informed consent, uh, which is truly remarkable uh, given the amount of time, uh, the short amount of time we've been pushing. Uh, we have all of this now on, on the web, so we are maintaining a roadmap to make sure that companies follow through on their commitments. Uh, and now we're really trying to uh, accompany the companies at the ground level to make sure they do their land studies, uh, to, to ensure that they are helping to resolve conflicts, and also to make sure that their commitments are made very public uh, so that, um, that others feel pressure to also address uh, land conflicts <laughs> and land rights. And we're moving now towards the traders, so Cargill, ABM, Ilovo Sugar have all made commitments to free prior informed consent also. They are, they're starting to feel the pressure. We're bringing on some new champions. And finally, we are trying to have an influence on some of the rating services so that they pick up the issue of land as part of their sustainability ratings uh, of companies. Okay, with that, I think I'm turning it back over to Duncan. Um, yeah, well, just to, to wrap it up, it's a, a couple of reflections. We really believe that um, what we're doing is helping to achieve objectives which we all own. Um, and by that, I, I'm, I, um, I'm also referring to members of the uh, global donor platform. Um, and, um, and so th th for us, we, I'd li we like, what we're seeing is that um, there's ownership of what we've, also, what we've achieved also uh, way beyond uh, just, you know, it's not just Oxfam celebrating, but we see the FAO celebrating and, uh, and the USAID celebrating and uh, et cetera. But um, uh, something for us which is really key is that we don't believe that we're going to succeed if we leave things simply at principles and guidelines. Uh, we need to see um, action to implement our principles and guidelines. And that's why we've gone um, directly to companies as well as uh, be involved in standard setting processes, which we also we, we support. And, um, the kind of evidence that we're looking for is companies that make not just make commitments, but actually do things like become transparent, you know, that, that Coke revealed its top three suppliers 
um, last year uh, was, 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 was very important and that they, they're going to reveal all of their direct suppliers of uh, sugarcane. It's also a very important commitment and shows that they mean business. Um, we're also looking for reporting and um, uh, changes in supply chain policies and due diligence policies uh, put in place, in, particularly in relation to the financial sector, and, and uh, companies being able to uh, really provide remedy when things go wrong uh, in a credible way. So these are, those are also the kind of things which, are, which really show that people are going to you know, put their money where their mouth is. Uh, and we believe that we have, to, we have to work on this side and not only work on uh, principles and guidelines and that kind of thing. Um, um, we also really think that there's a strong role for independent voices which can bring pressure to bear uh, and, and hold, hold duty bearers to account. And it's hard for the UN or for individual governments to, to do this kind of um, uh, work. And, uh, and we, we feel that uh, we and our colleagues in civil society have got an important role to play in, in uh, challenging uh, uh, the private sector to, to um, really um, um, make things move forward. So are we at a tipping point? This is my last slide. Um, uh, we... Well, one thing we've, uh, which, which uh, we, we noticed or I noticed recently is that um, some of the commitments that we've seen from companies under behind the ground exceed the kind of thing that we're seeing and in the, uh, the current draft of the RAI, the Responsible Agricultural Investment uh, Framework, which is being debated at the CFS. Um, so that's, uh, and, and promising to engage in those processes. So these, th those, those seem to us to be evidence that things are moving really in a new direction and picking up steam. But there's also a real risk that we can lose ground uh, if we don't follow through on these commitments. And as Chris was mentioning it earlier with regard to um, the food and beverage companies, but of course there are also other parts of the private sector we've been engaging with. So in, in that spirit, um, we're, we're really keen to look at how we can consolidate this because members of the, of the, of the donor platform in um, uh, taking these, these, these uh, achievements forward, consolidating what we've, we've done and um, potentially extending the um, approach to other areas such as the financial sector or, or perhaps even to governments. So I'll leave it at that and uh, I hope that that was clear. Thank you very much. I believe uh, the two of you are through with your presentations. Um, there's certainly very interesting aspects to it. Uh, I've come to think of a couple of questions, so I want to hand on to the audience, whoever wants to go first, to ask all those questions about the private sector and the involvement. Just go, whoever wants to go first. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, a specialist of the, the subject, but very interested in, and I was very impressed by the presentation. No, two two questions. The the presentation indeed covers mostly multinationals and international companies. I mean, uh, how about the other companies in the, the developing countries themselves? local companies or investors who are maybe less known coming from other parts of the world and so on. Uh, that's uh, the, the first point. The second point, um, you hardly mention the responsible agricultural uh, investment uh, principles. How much added value according to Oxfam is it going to add vis-à-vis -vis the voluntary guidelines? Thank you. Uh, hello, this is Andrew Hilton. First of all, many uh, congratulations to you for, for the hard work that you've put in on this. It's been a tremendously successful um, enterprise or uh, initiative that, you, that you've done the behind the brands. And, and uh, really, it's, it, people are uh, really starting to notice this. The, the fact that you've uh, had such big hits so early on in the process is tremendous. So um, many thanks to you for your efforts there. Um, we, uh, well, a couple of questions that spring to my mind is, uh, are um, how can we really monitor um, their, their responses? So if people are saying, yes, we are going to have zero, zero tolerance of land grabbing, um, do, do you feel that um, 
you can really sort of monitor that as, as um, you know, o- over the years, not just in the immediate future, because of course um, the the whole problems associated with with tenure um, and, and tenure models and investment models um, are, are um, really take a long time to resolve. So um, it's, it's a long term issue. So I'm just interested to know your longer term plans for monitoring. Uh, second part of the question is, um, what about those, um, it's a little bit like the, the uh, question, what about those that aren't on the list? So, you know, not the big 10, but others that um, uh, equally have, uh, have a large impact. Um, and then the third part of the question is, um, we um, at FAO and as and part of the land tenure unit here, um, rolling out the voluntary guidelines, of course, are very keen to engage with the private sector. Uh, we have a no- number of um, meetings that we're participating in this year with the private sector. Uh, now, many of those are are not these big brand names, but are um, uh, investors, for example, who are, who are putting massive amounts of money um, into land acquisition. Um, and um, we have to try and influence them as well. Um, obviously, we can show them uh, the reputational risk issues um, and also the the advantages. So we've got like a, a stick and carrot, really. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you have any other sort of thoughts on that, on, on not the big brands, but the other um, large impact um, in, um, players who are, for example, the investors. Thank you. And thanks, Guy and Andrew, for those questions. That's great. So we get this a lot about the other companies. Um, obviously, Oxfam cannot cover the uh, you know, close to a million companies that are out there or even the 100,000 multinationals. So we, we try to choose companies that we thought would have a significant influence on their own supply chains, but also on others uh, in industry bodies, um, suppliers, traders, profit, retailers, and we're already seeing that kind of multiplier effect. But I think that we're never going to get to all of the companies And so really the second part of this strategy has to be very much about building the capacity of national governments uh, to regulate their own sectors. And the way we're trying to push that is by uh, building the capacity of civil society groups to understand uh, the connections between these large um, purchasers of commodities and the the local conflicts around land. Uh, So transparency certainly helps build a, a stronger civil society movement that can then hold some of their local actors more accountable. We're seeing that happen in some of the countries already because of the commitment. And then secondly, by putting pressure on the national governments themselves. And that was the third part of our ask with every company is to be a public advocate to make sure that uh, they don't leave their commitments to their own supply chains, but they also become public voices uh, for stronger oversights uh, and, and stronger commitments from uh, governments themselves. And so we actually, we think that these companies can be um, a, a potentially good force in trying to level the playing field so that it's not, and they have a clear incentive to do that. If they are making certain compromises in, uh, by demanding higher standards, uh, then it's in their interest to insist that other companies do the same and that governments uh, take a, a stronger role in, in overseeing that. In terms of Andrew's question on monitoring, again, it's very hard to go from a a simple commitment and expect that you can leave it there. The way that we're hoping, uh, or I shouldn't say hoping, the way that we are anticipating that um, these companies will follow through with their commitments is uh, threefold. One, we are doing our own uh, efforts to hold them accountable for their commitments. As I said, everything is very public. Uh, The reason that these companies responded in the first place was because of public pressure. That pressure is now ratcheted up by their commitments. So we have roadmaps showing exactly what they've committed to, and we have, uh, you know, various ways of putting pressure on the companies publicly if they don't follow through with their commitments. And, and we believe they actually will follow through. Uh, if, if anything, it, it's tougher for them to avoid it now than it was two months ago when they when they could have tried to ignore the issue. But the second part of that is by making things more transparent by by um, identifying their suppliers uh, by making their supply chains more transparent through their impact studies, 
that's also a form of public accountability. And so that gives civil society groups and governments and media a chance to hold those companies and suppliers more accountable. Um, and then the third one is the companies are putting these commitments into their supplier codes. That means that Coca-Cola does auditing on 200, in 200 countries. Uh, it, it, and many can't even find 200 countries, but that's Coca-Cola has identified 202 countries, I think, where they have suppliers and they have supplier codes and where they do auditing. And, and Coca-Cola actually has very robust auditing on labor issues, on health and environmental issues. By incorporating land into those auditing processes, the company itself now has, create, has, has, has incorporated land into an existing enormous mechanism for its own auditing. And it does that because it recognizes that there are risks in, in these kinds of land conflicts. And that brings me to Andrew's last question about investors. Reputational risk is a big one. But the other is that land conflicts are creating big problems for companies on the ground and for investors. And we know that in many countries uh, across the developing world, land is not formally titled. So the, the potential for land risk, where you have multiple parties making claims on the same land, is enormous. And that risk is only increasing as, as NGOs and, and communities gain more information, gain access to um, technology that allows them to quickly scandalize companies. So it, it has some uh, studies now have put together or have tried to quantify that risk of having investments and, and production held up by community and social conflict. And I think that's the other side of, of, the, the, care, of the stick that can push investors to do the right thing. That's to say that there's a reputational issue, but there's also a, a, a production delay issue or even a land confiscation issue that many investors have to be made more aware of. Uh, I'll turn it over to Duncan, though, to deal with the RAI and other pieces of that. Yeah, with regard to the RAI, I, I, mean, I did actually mention it a couple of times, Guy. Um, I didn't mention the PRAI, those ones that came out in 2010 so much, but um, what the process that's going on now in Rome, uh, we, we, we value it very much. And um, we particularly, uh, the reason why we believe it has so much potential is because um, uh, we, we hope that we're going to see um, uh, a sufficient level of ownership and engagement in the process for these to be um, uh, you know, widely owned by the various stakeholders who engage, as we saw with the voluntary guidelines process. Um, so in that respect, you know, we see a lot of, lot of potential, but of course, you know, a lot of that also depends on, on the level of ambition of those um, negotiating this. Um, there, are, there are indeed principles out there and, and things like, for example, the, the principles and criteria around the um, responsible, sustainable palm oil, which, uh, which, uh, which are, you know, quite set the bar quite high. Um, the question is, will things like the, will the new RAI principles actually go beyond these or will they undercut them? Uh, and there's always a possibility of a sort of dumbing down in, in a negotiation. And of course, we're concerned about that. And uh, we're, we're engaging in those discussions and, and, and trying to, uh, you know, push, keep the bar high. Uh, and uh, so I think we're, we're all uh, hoping for the best and uh, but, uh, be, trying to be realistic at the same time. But uh, the other thing is that uh, I understand the RAI uh, process inside CFS also to provide signals to um, national governments on how they can uh, put in place public policy measures and regulations as well. And, uh, and that's something which uh, you can't achieve uh, by targeting companies directly. The other thing, I just, just to add to this, this challenge about monitoring uh, the responses and, and following up, you know, Andrew's question, and, and thanks for your congratulations, by the way, Andrew. Um, it's indeed, uh, I, I think the other thing to say is that um, we've got lots of ideas in Oxfam about how to do this. And uh, we, we recognize that we can't do everything, so we have to be strategic. Um, but we are also very keen to engage in conversations with other players in the field to think about how we can consolidate these, these achievements. Because you know, we're limited by the number of hours in the day and, and you know, how much resources we've got. So that's why I say that we're looking for partners. Um, the final thing with regard to investors, just, on, just, to, take, just to tackle that at another level, is, is that yes, we are very aware about the fact that there are many, many players who um, uh, don't have big brands and aren't such easy targets or um, so easy to influence. Um, but we've, we've done quite some work on that as well. And uh, I think that in, my, in our, some of our conversations with the FAO on private sector, which we've started, we can share that more 
one on one, but it would have to be for another day if we wanted to talk about uh, how far we've got in discussing with the private sector, with the, with the financial sector, um, what they can do, because we, those discussions do take place. They're just less high profile than, than with Coca-Cola and Pepsi. If I listen to you guys, I, I, one can get the impression that the really big guys like Coca-Cola can't really allow themselves to be really that bad, in, in other words. Uh, because they are so much in the limelight, and maybe also they have the resources to to react to to Oxfam very quickly. So, what do you think first? What makes Coca Cola move so quick when you ask them? So, what is the what is there maybe for you to replicate if that if Coca Cola can, maybe others can do that as well. And the other thing is, um, what about the sort of second layer of of companies that? don't have the resources to, to do all that that Coca-Cola can do. So, um, Pascal, I, I, I think your first question is what had to do with why companies like Coca-Cola are responding so quickly. Well, we have some sense of that. And um, clearly, they are uh, as concerned about their reputation as we always expected, and I would say even more so now in the age of social media. So, we, we on our first spike, we had three large consumers of cocoa, Mars, Nestle, and Mondelez, they, they were 40% of the market, of the cocoa market. And two of them came around quickly. The third one wouldn't move. And finally, the third one sent four vice presidents to our office to negotiate with us. And we, one of them came off to the side with me and said, um, no matter what happens today, I just want to make a, a, a personal request uh, that you call off the Facebook uh, postings. And, um, I, you know, I realized that in that moment, this is really our first big effort to use Facebook and tweet, tweeting and the sort of multipliers like some of us and of us that can generate hundreds of thousands of tweets and emails and so forth. And it really has an impact. Uh, and so, you know, getting the New York Times to pick up these stories is important. Getting some public visibility on the ground is important. But I think social media has been the real game changer for us, which is um, which is really good because it tends to level the playing field. It, it's it's much uh, less, co it's much more cost effective uh, to deploy a lot of the um, sort of creative uses of social media than to make the the, the mainstream media buy that we used to have to sometimes do. So that one on that. Uh, in terms of your second question, Pascal, smaller companies and 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 what can they do? Every company can do something in, um, uh, in, in, re in relation to their size. So even under the UN guiding principles, there's an acknowledgement um, that the depth of the responsibilities and obligations will be in some ways tempered by the size of the company. It, by the same token, um, we don't expect every small um, supplier to be able to go to the length that a Coca-Cola does. But um, there are things that, is, that every supplier and every purchaser of commodities does need to be aware of, for, and they do need to make public commitments around things like, um, you know, child labor, human rights, land grabs. There's no reason why um, even a small supplier cannot make those commitments, cannot do the sort of minimal due diligence uh, to make sure that uh, where it's purchasing, uh, those suppliers also have certain commitments in place. Uh, they have to have contracts with every one of their suppliers, so that can be part of the negotiations over contracts. Where I think it gets tough is deploying the kind of auditing uh, that Coca-Cola and others can afford to do. Um, and I think that, you know, in some cases, we won't expect the smaller companies to be able to do that kind of robust auditing. But there is a, a, there's certainly a tiered uh, level of responsibility that every company can, can take on. Maybe just to add to that, if I may. Um, I think that the <clears throat> the other thing is that this is also a question a bit about our model of change, and um, we clearly believe that that uh, a, a big player with a big brand and uh, which, which is let's say more willing to to change first can end up being a front runner that can lead change across the rest of a sector, and it's not a new model. And a good example of it is is uh, companies like Nike and Adidas that move, moved uh, before other sportswear companies in taking steps to improve working conditions and exclude child labor from their supply chains. Um, and, it, and again, it's no, secret that, no surprise that they went, they went first. But um, 
it, nowadays it's very it's, i think it's really hard to find any uh company that that says uh, that they proudly use child labor although they don't try to exclude that in in uh, among their suppliers so i think that um uh to a certain extent um getting a change at the at the peak of the industry can end up um creating a kind of paradigm change or a, nor a normative change which um which which uh, becomes eventually a kind of accepted uh, moral way forward for the rest of the field and so uh, obviously we we would hope that um, we're achieving something similar on land to the things that have been achieved in in other the other areas that chris mentioned which include child labor you mentioned that this that your social media activity has made an impact and got the attention of these large companies they've made a corporate commitment do you have a contingency in the event that these big companies also make use of social media and sort of take charge of their commitment and limit it to their liking? Well, always. I think it's, um, it's always a dangerous game to try to use uh, the marketing heft of a Coca-Cola uh, for our purposes. And so we have to be clear-eyed about uh, just how far we can push a company and um, the kind of responses they may have. Um, but we also have to recognize that Coke is already doing this, that they spend all day uh, with all of their, you know, enormous resources thinking about how they can market their brands um, through social media and other media sources. What we're trying to do is say, we want, as part of that marketing, we want you to ver make very explicit commitments to things like zero tolerance for land grabs and to, to, to land rights that are predefined. So Coca-Cola does not have the luxury of defining free prior informed consent. It can't manipulate, I mean, it can manipulate a lot of things about what a consumer might consider to be a good product, but it can't manipulate uh, rights that are defined by others. And so I, I think that we, we hope that by getting them to make very concrete commitments to rights that are defined by others and for us to keep insisting on that through our leverage. And, and again, they may have, they do have a large mouthpiece, but increasingly the public because of all the public engagement on, on these tools, also has a somewhat countervailing mouthpiece uh, that we think that we can hold them to those kinds of commitments. It, it, but it's, you know, it, it's a real test, and I think it's a great question. We'll, we'll have to see. Uh, we're always um, concerned that we might be used by the companies uh, in the same way that we're trying to use them. I'll leave it up to the two presenters to maybe say a final word on what, what you always wanted to tell us about vice presidents uh, coming to your office. That seems to be very interesting. And I'm sure they're very happy if we publicize that they do do that and what comes out of it. So if you want to say some more interesting stories of that or wrap up um, the discussion, otherwise I think we're through. I would just say that uh, really we, we, we spent a number of years struggling around questions of land. In fact, Going back 20 years, uh, Oxfam was working on land issues with indigenous communities around extractive industries, oil and mining and so forth. In just this last year, we have seen such remarkable uh, change in the food and beverage industry that it still leaves me, um, you know, wondering if, if all of this can be happening as quickly as we're seeing it. And Duncan mentioned um, a tipping point. I really believe that we are at that tipping point. When, when the likes of Cargill, ADM, Coke, Pepsi, uh, Ilovo, Sugar, when they all say that they now will respect free prior informed consent, that is really a, a significant public declaration. And, and that's a lot of political capital and influence uh, that we can now try to push uh, in order to get stronger government commitments, in order to get actual change on the ground. Uh, so I, I think that you know, we are seeing real movement, uh, but there's a real risk and this is one of the pressures that we feel and why we, we're so happy to be addressing the likes of the, the donor platform. There's a real risk that this could be lost. Uh, Oxfam doesn't have the resources to, to track all of these commitments on the ground. Other NGOs in this land field also uh, are, are, are struggling for resources. And so um, I think that this is a great moment in terms of bang for the buck uh, for donors uh, to consider uh, the kind of um, change that 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 awaits us uh, because of these large corporate commitments, and um, this has been a real pleasure to be able to address all of you to just give you a sense of of how we see it from uh, the the lens of the behind the brands campaign. From my side, I would just uh, I want to hark back to 
the uh, that World Bank report about uh, rising global interest in farmland, in, in which came out in 2010, uh, or was leaked in 2010, I can't remember. But um, uh, one of its re recommendations was that, uh, in addition to improving, uh, strengthening the governance of land tenure, etc., that it was important to support watchdogs. And, and I hope that um, the things that we've been involved in doing in recent years, along with some of our colleagues in civil society, has helped show what can be done if there are uh, strong independent voices out there. Um, but um, we, what we're seeing is, you know, we're, what we're doing now is just, uh, you know, the beginning, and there's a lot more that needs to be done in order to uh, uh, retain a sort of sense of uh, accountability moving forward. So um, we really, really appreciate um, that we've had a chance to speak to you about our experiences, um, and uh, so we thank you for that. And and we're very open to discuss this this further, either with the, the, the platform at a future, future stage or with any individual members of the platform. And, and I guess with that, I'll, I'll say thanks very much.